I was terrified. I, I, I think this is our sign to start. Rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the DevCore 101 session. I hope you all came for that, for that session specifically. If not, please stay, don't leave. Uh, <laughs> No, that was a little while ago. We were supposed to bring drinks. Yeah. Uh, my name is Agnes Sigler. I work for Axpace. I am also co-chairing the Def Corps committee with Rob. Hello, and I'm Rob Hirschfeld, and uh, I work for Rackin, a startup doing physical provisioning. Uh, I used to be the old crowbar stuff. So, so uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to gi give a quick intro to Def Corps. And then we'll have some really hard questions for you all, or you can ask us, and uh, we'll have Sam answer them. <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow we have two working sessions back to back. This is how uh, Def Corps works. It's all about the community, and the work gets done in our meetings, or if we meet in person, we get them done in, in working group sessions in person. So. Uh, what is DevCo really about? It's uh, hopefully it's about user experience, and uh, we're here to represent them. Because if you, if if I implement a version of OpenStack and Rob implements a version of OpenStack, the two may not look exactly the same, and uh, the applications that uh, Sam writes may not be able to work the same way on both of them. So, which makes him cry. You know. <laughs> <laughs> You so could be speaker of the house. <laughs> with OpenStack being so huge, uh, how do we control uh, and, and make sure that one OpenStack is interoperable with another? And uh, I guess, yeah, someone has to decide what's going to win and what's going to lose, and uh, who's going to pick the winners and losers? Anyone? Anyone want to pick them? No. Anyone wants to decide which APIs will be required? Yeah, so uh, that, that's the fun part. And this is what Def Corps co uh, committee tries to do. And uh, what we do is we try to get feedback from everybody. We try to get feedback from ev everybody that speaks up, uh, either in person, email, IRC, or any other format that you can think of. If you don't speak up, we will not listen to you. Uh, um, it's just the way it is. You, you have to make sure that we know what it is that you have issues with. Or if, if you disagree with a particular API being required uh, for interoperability, then someone has to tell us about it. Right. We're, we're very anti-star chamber. Right? We don't want you know, a select group of people deciding how everybody's cloud should look. Right? That's not OpenStack. Right, which means that we might be hearing conflicting opinions. Uh, someone might say, no, no, I really want this API. And I was like, well, it's, it's really uh, an extension. It should not be part of Dev Corps. It, it should not be required for every single cloud out there, even though it is someone's baby. Uh, it's just not going to be in the main core group of APIs. So are we being fair about these APIs? Hopefully you can tell us. All right. How many people know what Def Core is? Almost unanimous. I'm, I, my job here is to spend as little time as possible educating the people who didn't raise their hand, okay. which is not very many people. So uh, this is the obligatory what is Def Core slide. Uh, it's a process right, that sets the base requirements for all OpenStack products, right? so products with two pieces, must pass tests and designated code. Okay. And the, com the definitions uh, use community resources. So this isn't external, it's within the community and it drives interoperability for minimum standards and it's about products labeled OpenStack. So it's a branding component. Which one's forward? All right. So the things to parse that out a little bit, Def Core is about commercial use. Right. This isn't about I created a new project and I brought new code into OpenStack. This is about I'm selling something using OpenStack. Okay. That's what we control. That's what Def Core is for. Now it obviously echoes backwards, but that's what that's where where our jurisdiction is. Right. And it's, only, it's only about applicable if you want to put OpenStack logo on it on your website. 
if you just want to have your own grape flavored open stack, uh, but not call it open stack and not have the logo for it and not sell it as open stack product, then you can do whatever you like. Now, if you're selling it open stack code and you're not, you don't want to use the brand, that's actually a problem for the board to deal with because that means that people are using the code but not actually claiming to use the code. And it's perfect, it's Apache. That's okay, but that means that there's something that says OpenStack as a brand is not valuable enough for you to feel like you needed to use it. Does that make sense? So, so there's a very virtuous cycle in here. So what does DevCore deliver? Uh, we have a process, we have artifacts. The artifacts look like uh, these guidelines. This is the text version. We have a JSON version of these guidelines. And the guidelines basically give you a definition of all the things that you have to have. And what that looks like is not that. <laughs> Thank you. What that looks like is a, ser a stack up of uh, platform capabilities components. So I'm gonna, I have a slide in a minute that'll talk about this, so we're just a little out of order. Um, but what happens is we publish these guidelines every six months. We give them very clever names like 2015.07 which is the month we pass them, so things are very clear. They're not about releases, they are about point in time. So if you think about the, this graph shows you the release building up code and we're adding more and more capabilities into the release, we pick a subset of the overall capabilities and then we add those into these guidelines. So the guidelines aren't the whole of OpenStack, that would be impressive, we'll talk about that, it's one of our questions. Um, it's a subset that we think is the required minimum and then those build on themselves on, on each other over time. So it's it's literally time snapshots. That's what a guideline is about. And then the guideline internally has uh, at the top this platform concept. The platform is de decomposed into components, so compute and storage components. And inside the component, there are capabilities, which you might call a feature. We call them capabilities because they're API based. And then those capabilities are validated using tests tests come out of Tempest and so it's sort of this upward stack the community builds tests and we lump those tests into capabilities and then components and platforms okay it is possible though we don't have any examples yet of having a component that was not part of the platform uh, like heat is one of the things that's coming up through as a potential new component and that component may or may not be licensed as a standalone thing we have mechanisms to deal with that Oh. And that's so I'm going to pause for a second before we jump into the bulk of the kind of people. Does that help people understand DEFCOR a little bit? Any questions? Did we, did we lose anyone yet? It's okay if we did because, yes. Does DEFCOR cover? So there's only two right now. There's uh, Object, which is basically Swift, and Compute, which is Nova, Glance, Keystone, we're adding Neutron and Cinder. Right. So, so when, when you see products, OpenStack powered compute, then it, it will be just focused on the, on the compute aspect, which is no one the related, like that you need to have in there. When you have a platform, that means they have both compute and uh, storage. Or you can just have just a Swift based product and it, it will be called uh, OpenStack powered object storage. So the thing that's confusing sometimes, when we talk about a component, it really is about licensing. So you have to take off your technical hat and put on a vendor hat. So when, when the components are all about somebody being able to license parts of OpenStack and, and certify them as a product, like Swift, so that would be OpenStack powered storage. Or if somebody wants to run compute without Swift, then that would be OpenStack powered compute, uh, DreamHost, who uses Ceph instead of Swift. So they each have a license mechanism, and then a lot most most people do both, and they're the platform, and so you know what you're getting with that. Great question. That's actually, I think, a good segue to the lessons learned. Right. So uh, one of the lessons we learned was that there are never enough tests, and uh, I think I'm going out. Of oh, sorry. Out of yeah, it's it's number two on my list. Uh, be, because these tests were not written uh, thinking about DevCore. DevCore came way after most of those tests were written, and uh, when we started thinking, okay, how do we look at it? Do we write a whole new set of 
tests that has just the of course specific stuff. Uh, nobody really jumped up and said, yes, we want to do that. So we went with what's already in place, which is Tempest test. And um, we go, when we look at the test, I think for main things, it's pretty good coverage. Like, can you spin up an instance? That's pretty well tested, right? And uh, things like that. So we do uh, look at things and make sure that it's there. We're, we're, we're really considering of making sure that there's more than one test for the capability instead of just one test. Uh, also, we have a process calling test flagging. So for example, if um, we have something in our guideline that says you must pass uh, these tests and someone comes up to us and says, you know what, this test is great and it does, I don't know, uh, create VM, but it's actually calling, I don't know, heat, for example. A terrible example, not a real We actually one. had something similar where it was calling, um, a, there was a requirement in one test for a API that wasn't required in the platform, and so that test would break if you, in certain cases, right? Right, so in, in that case, the vendor will come to the dev core committee and says, hey, I would like this test to be flagged, uh, and not, making it not necessarily required for that particular set of tests to pass. And uh, we have a list of acceptable reasons why tests could be flagged. You can't just flag tests arbitrarily, so it has to be like either a test is broken, uh, it's calling something that's not required, and a few right. other things that I don't remember we, now. We, we actually use Garrett as part of this process, and so we use, it, it looks like a development project, right? We have a hacking rules, that's what Vic was referring to. We have, you know, Garrett reviews, and, and all our files go through those processes. So it's very community-oriented from an OpenStack perspective. Step mm, number three. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, API and implementation matters. Uh, if a test fails 90% uh, of the time because of the performance, it's probably not a very good test. Right. Um, so yes, right now we don't have just performance specific tests in Dev Core, uh, but if someone comes up to us and says, hey, this test is really terrible because it almost never passes, that is probably a good reason for flagging it. So, it's whatever the test is testing. Right. So, I, and there, we only pick a percentage of the test. So if the test is not you know, usable as an API test, ideally we would bring in as many tests as possible. And this is why the flagging exists. So sometimes we scoop up a test and a vendor comes along and says, I can't pass this test because it's not fair. Right, and the, it, it's, not, it's, it's not random tests that people have to pass. We actually go through a process called scoring and evaluate, and during that scoring, we'll look at the tests and see uh, what tests test which capability. So it's, it's actually tied, and uh, we have some great people doing a lot of work on uh, uh, scoring and actual actually looking at these tests and telling us, no, this is a terrible test for this capability, or yes, this is a great test for that capability. Right. right, and uh, for those of you that don't know, this is Catherine. She, she's the PTL of the RevStack project, which, and the RevStack was written uh, just so it is easier to run uh, these dev core tests. Yep. And uh, it, it has rules and checks everything. It's Garrett, actually. So what, what happens is if you have, if we have a test in the system, there's a, you, the, a vendor would actually add a patch that would flag that test, and then we would review that. It was part of our normal review process. Um, 
So everything's very public. When people ask for things, they have to provide justification. And, and so it's a, we, we've made the process incredibly transparent um, by, by conforming to OpenStack process. Correct. Right, right now we're not using Launchpad. You can submit a Garrett bug or Garrett issue yourself to the DevCore project. Yes? Ah, that's an excellent question. So the, the guidelines themselves go through a, a six-month scoring process, and we, we actually have a, a, what we call next file, where we, we build up this review. And so we're constantly adding it the next file. We do patches and reviews and things like that. And then um, at the summits, we, we clone that file into a, pr a, pr a proposed guideline or review guideline. And then that has three months of time for the community to review it which we did just last week, the board actually approved, uh, or you know, we showed it to the, v the board, which kicks off this review cycle. Um, and then people would submit patches against that. There, there be for process-wise, and we have actually a long process document, uh, things just don't get pulled out of guidelines because that ends up not being fair for the community. Um, what we don't want to change the rules on vendors, so when we create a guideline, we've, we've gone through a slow process to get there doesn't change very quickly and so we don't just take things out. Now if we find an error, usually it's a test error and fla we flag the test. So we wouldn't remove a capability, we would remove the tests. We had one capability, all the tests were flagged um, for valid reasons and we removed that capability because there was no test for it. Now there, there is a, so there, there are two different phases like one in the guideline when the test is already required in, in a required status. Now at this moment, we also have a lot of tests that are going through review and uh, they're going to become advisory next time unless someone submits a patch and says, hey, can you remove this? I disagree with this test. So now is the time to review all of the upcoming changes. The, the ones that are not advisory yet and are in the next is for everyone in the community to review, submit patches, submit comments and say, hey, I think this test is terrible and uh, I." Right now, I don't know how many tests we have in the .next guideline that are not advisory or required yet, and we will, they will not be going into the next guideline because we had a lot of conversations uh, in the last three months about, so the process, uh, about so those tests. Today, the .next, the next file, and the guideline, the, the next guideline are the same. So what we, we're actually about to start taking patches to pull things out of the what we call 2016.01 because that's when it's supposed to be approved. The 2016.01 guideline will start removing uh, capabilities from uh, based on the community process. So you, the, the action for people out of this, this meeting is to go, this, this session is to go to that file, look at that file, 2016.01.json, and say, and if, if there's something in there that looks bad, submit a patch, removing that, that entry, and we'll start a discussion on it, right? Now, that's only for the capabilities that are not yet in advisory or required status. <laughs> that's so true. That, this is where it, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's where it gets confusing. There is already capabilities that are in either required They're required. The advisory required. Will, take, will take patches on. Yes, so if it's already required, that's a different process. Also, Garrett process, you flag it to make it either deprecated or have a good reason where it's like, hey, this test is terrible, uh, it no longer exists, or something like that. And yeah, we'll we, we look at all of those that come in. But yes, uh, capabilities that are not yet required, this is the time. Now is the time until January. Afterwards, it will be a lot more complicated. I think I saw getting a couple great, hands. Great questions. Uh, we, we can, and so we're getting a lot of sort of 101 questions, which is fine. So we'll slow down and we'll go back through because my, my DEF Core review was super fast. And so I love these questions and we'll make sure we, we explain it. Um, uh, we, you know, we, we, the only one that really catches people's eye is Keystone, which has not, not that much testing. 
there's all we always need more tests, right? So it, it really would be look at you look at a capability and say, oh, I'd like to have more tests on that, and you could write them, and we'd encourage that. There's no cap uh, there's no capability that couldn't use more tests. Um, Every ta every capability. So every capability needs more tests. I, I, I mean, it, it, we could flag out individual ones, but at the end of the day, if 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 you have the capability to write a test for something, just write the write the tests on whatever capability, and we'll we'll start pulling them in. I, it, there's, I, I don't want a single one out because I, I wouldn't, you know, except for Keystone, which we could always use more tests on because we we added the Keystone test to give it coverage. Um, the, and the reason we had to do that is because people felt the Keystone was getting covered because it's a, it's a has to be tested by everything else. So, so people were like, "Well, we don't actually have to test Keystone because it's already thoroughly tested." And so, but we actually needed it as a as a test. But yeah, I, I don't want to. It's a it's a fine suggestion, but it, it would only sort of bias people to go do that work. Any time, if you want to write tests, just write tests. We'll pick them up. Uh, so, it depends on what your objective is. Mm -hmm. So, this is actually one of the items, this is actually the number one item on this list as a lessons learned. Um, right, and you were so right now, technically what you're supposed to do is for the logo, you have to certify once a year. Now, how many products are you certifying? If, if you are, and th this is this is a hard question, right? If it's just slightly different uh, version of what uh, of one product, is that really a new product? Um, I don't know. So So there, there, there's a couple of answers to this. Uh, so I don't want to be w squishy. I, I actually want to try and be specific for you. So the, the foundation has rules that apply these guidelines to your certification as a vendor. And, and they are very specific. This is what I need to do to keep my license compliance to use the brand. And that, that will require you to, to submit a result once a year against one of the most two recent versions of, of OpenStack. And they, they have all sorts of logo requirements and things like that. What, I'd, what we'd love to see is for every cloud deployment you do in the field, you run your test. And so Canonical's you know, already certified. You got your brand. Pressure's off. Every time you do a deployment, I would love to see everybody in the room doing this. Every time you do a deployment, you run the test suite against it. You take those results. You upload them to RefStack. And even if they don't pass everything, they give us data about what you've implemented. So logo aside. You can get that by doing a generic deployment. But what we really want to accomplish as a community is we want to know if you've turned things off and it's no longer in compliance or you've, you've added things that, are, that aren't required in compliance but still pass the test, if you upload that data to RefStack, then we actually start collecting data about things that are in use or not in use, passing or not passing. And that turns into things that we then can action So RefStack's designed to be able to take whatever results you want, and so just upload them. Right. So you, so you wouldn't. Hmm? Right. So so the more data we collect, the better, and then your, the vendor gets to choose which ones of those are representative of your product. But the more the more data we get, the better we're going to be able to do it. And so we and if you took the same cloud and did it twenty times, we have, we also can track that it's the same cloud over and over again. And so we won't we don't get that doesn't create false positive results. Yeah. Ah, good question. 
question. So right now, all of the tests are in Tempest, but uh, or runnable by Tempest. Yeah, but uh, going forward, I think they're working on Tempest plugins where the t other tests are not Tempest tests can be run by Tempest. So they they do not have to be in Tempest repo. They do have to be OpenStack controlled. Okay, and they, they do have to be runnable by Tempest or its plugins. So if you wrote some, uh, you know, uh, Rackspace had a list, had tests that were completely outside of Tempest, those tests we wouldn't consider. We might one day, today we made the decision it was too confusing to take multiple sources. There's nothing inherent in what we do that limits us to only using Tempest. It is a policy decision for the present to keep people's heads from exploding. Mm -hmm. If they could be run by the Tempest framework. Yes, and uh, like in Swift's case, they have their own tests, and we're just wait, waiting for the Tempest plugin so that those tests can be run through the same the same way. So it's an, uh, that is actually one of the questions we have for, for the audience to discuss um, because there are pros and cons to how fast we absorb new capabilities into the system and then what the, the repercussions are. Um, and so actually we want to, um, I don't want to shortchange these questions because they're really good, but we, we want to do a little bit of show of hands about some of these issues because what you're describing is, is a non-trivial question, right? It's, it's shades of gray on that one. Other question? So that is also one of our audience questions. <laughs> um, generally, historically, we have been small core trailing indicator, meaning right. We we need to, we're trying to identify a small set, the minimum set needed to run um, a, a workable cloud, sort of the defin the the concept, and then the things that are established in market, not things that we think are coming and we want to force people to adopt. However. That is, there, there are elements where in that where people want to expand what we do for good reason and people want to be more forward-looking forward, forward looking on API conformance, not this trailing. And so part of what we're trying to do, part of the reason for this session is to have people think through, oh, the implications of forcing an API adoption, Keystone V3 adoption. If DEF Core makes it a requirement, then vendors are going to have to implement it. Rock on, that might be awesome. But it's also going to hurt users because now users are going to find that they're not compatible with Rackspace implements Keystone V3 to be compliant with the new guideline. Now everybody who's running an older cloud is going to have compatibility issues because V2 and V3 aren't compatible. And so we have to shred, sort of thread the needle of how those things work. Right, and it's, it's all about, we look how commonly a component is used uh, what's the future technical direction and are other tools using it? So if all of the tools are using one version, we, it, it would be really hard for us to go forward. Yes? So, so technically, that's we, a, we that's do a have a, like, a, I, I would, I would, it, so there's a technical issue that keeps them from being, I would love for the, the, the technical deliveries to always be backwards compatible, multiple versions, and then we wouldn't have to have this conversation. But. I, 
Ah, we, we, so we had this discussion. No. <laughs> it, 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 we had a long discussion about it, and, and the, the, the simple answer is no. It, it causes all sorts of challenges and, and right, problems and, and things like that. And it's here we're thinking about interoperability, right? So from a user's perspective, uh, if they're, what are they going to code to and how are they making sure or they don't, we don't want them doing extra work uh, from going from one cloud to another. They expected OpenStack to behave the same way and this is what it's all about, right? It's interoperability. We It, it, this, the, now you see why we put, we start the slide with, are we picking winners and losers? <laughs> right. I, we, we, we take that very seriously. We are very contemplative about what we're doing. And here's the, the dilemma. We have to pick something. Right. It, it is a w bigger harm for us to say we're not picking and just let it ride because then everybody just does whatever they want. We have to make a choice to create an interoperability. Ah. I strongly agree with that statement, which is why DEF Core was designed as a trailing indicator, so that we wouldn't hurt users, right? This is why the Tron reference, right? We fight for the users. The, the challenge is that you, we have a significant amount of pressure to adopt leading APIs that would cause that problem. And so part of our ongoing discussion is to, to basically we have this tension within the spec to say which API are we going to pick? Are we going to hurt users who are using the product by and, but then make it harder for migration to future APIs because now we've basically told users they have a two-year window to keep using Keystone V2. Right. And, and the windows are exactly it. It's not easy. It. It's uh, the windows are exactly it. For a any current uh, moment in time, you can use the last two guidelines, which hopefully would be like a year uh, and that could even cover like the previous releases. So you don't necessarily have to be on the latest guideline on the latest release. You can be, a, you you will be able to certify if you are not running the newest version of trunk. Right, and that, that's why when we score, do the scoring, we we ask the users, what is it that you're using? We're, we're not just uh, deciding this in our closed little chamber and saying, hey, Rob, do you think V2 or V3 is better in this case? Yes. 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 So if we saw a lot of Keystone V3, then we could have, um, and we're just picking on V3. We have this issue on multiple APIs. But, but if, if we have a whole bunch of data showing people adopting Keystone V3, then it makes us more, it makes it easier for us to say, you know what, there's actually a, a, a tipping forward adoption, right? And one of the things that that helps us do is actually make the user surveys, which are based on 350 you know, people volunteering information, we could actually be getting much more comprehensive data that actually told us not just, hey, are you using Keystone or not? Are you using Keystone V2? Are you using Keystone V3? Are you using, you know, 
the token or using the catalog or using, and we'd actually know down to the capability what people are doing. Um, and then we can make very fine grain answers. I, I, I sympathize with your, you know, the angst. We, we have this problem all the time. We have to make the decision, right? Somebody has to say, this is the required API and this, this isn't. So that the extent to which that that is technically feasible, we, we strongly encourage people to adopt as much of the API as they can and as they want as to provide utility for them. We're, we're just trying to say what the minimum set that, that right. you have to do if you want to be a product. Right now we're looking at a minimum and also this is, remember, this is for companies that want to certify, uh, to have the OpenStack logo in their product. If someone is running SX OpenStack, they will not be able to get the new logo for it, right? That doesn't mean they can't run it or can't provide it to their customers. Right. I, I mean, the can't part is optional, but I, I, I mean, it's, it's going to be there. We're not, uh, we're not forcing users to implement the newest feature in Throw or Nova or whatever. It's, it's actually established feature set. Right. We're It, totally. There's a, the oh. right. and and and, and so one of, one of the things I, I, I want to, I'm, I'm going to abstract this for a second, and then we'll keep going back to questions. Actually, are we out of time? Anyone How much else? time do we have? Four more minutes, excellent. <laughs> I, so, so actually, so I, we have a couple, uh, I want to actually do the slides. Um, this intentionally creates pressure to have these conversations. So the, the conversation, please come to the working sessions, but the, the questions you are asking are exactly the questions we want people to ask. And we did this knowing it would put backwards pressure on the technical community to create migration paths and things like that. Because at the end of the day, somebody does have to say, this is the API that we're gonna require for interoperability and it's gonna flow backwards. Um, could you jump to I don't think we have time. We'll upload these slides and we can do this. But I would ask you to think about what does success for OpenStack look like? And um, the short version of this is we don't know. My, my thought is if we have an ecosystem of people building products that require OpenStack, then that's success, right? Counting installations is nice, but though if, if vendors are building products for OpenStack, then that is actually an indication that we have a, a market. That was one of the, uh, that was the fourth question on this. Um, we're yes. beginning to talk about it. It's a, it is a challenge, yes. It, ha it has been brought up and yes, it, it, it's something that we need to, hopefully next cycle we'll have time for it. Or yeah, I, we're, they're much less equal than we thought. Yes, and just re remember DevCore became official uh, la uh, <laughs> this year in March, right? So it's r we're still refining the process and we're trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Right. And uh, these, are, these are the lessons that ca came up through the last half a year uh, when we actually started, uh, when OpenStack Foundation started requiring these tests being passed and this is what we saw. This is, these are the issues we heard people br bring to us. Right, uh, yes, uh, there, there's a patch right now and we, we have started talking about it. 
the the actual process for the foundation is right now once a year and we're lo looking to see if it's going to be required right. more than that so i want this is this is actually a nice segue to me and this is what i like about the besides the tron reference um right def core is not going to win foundation is not going to win community is not going to win if it's the foundation with a bat hitting vendors on the knees to make them comply. The users have the power. If the users are demanding that vendors comply with the latest guideline or the advisory guideline, that is where we'll start getting a, you know, a, a hosts keeping a, you know, showing their score on a daily basis. I'm compliant, I'm compliant, I'm compliant, I'm compliant with the latest, I'm compliant with the next. That, if the users are asking that question, that's where the power of these guidelines comes in. It is absolutely not from the foundation enforcing on brand, right? That's the, that, that's the weakest way to do it. It's the users who are saying, use these guidelines. If you're not passing the guidelines, we're going to get mad. That's where the power is going to come in. That's where the actual movement is going to come from the vendors. You're right. Right. So I, I think you covered it pretty well. Um, we need your input. Yeah, if you are a user, we definitely need your input. If you are an operator, uh, speak up during our meetings because what we decide will affect your product, will affect your deployment. And uh, we definitely don't want to be that bad that goes around and breaks your product. And, or we definitely don't want to be that stick that foundation gets to use to issue your logo. Uh, we do have a lot of questions <laughs> and challenges, which uh, we covered some of them. Uh, and it, it's it's still a huge work in progress, and uh, we we wanted this to be an interactive session. Thank you for providing yes. a lot of interaction. Thank you. Uh, we, that's that's what we want. Yes, join us tomorrow. <laughs>